Well, good evening, everybody. We'd like to welcome you tonight to our Hendersonville Regional Planning Commission meeting on this night of September 7th. Glad everybody's here this evening. Let's uh, bow for a word of prayer. Lord, we come before you tonight and we thank you for the great city of Hendersonville. We thank you for all the citizens. We thank you for the opportunity to live in uh, a free country. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with us tonight as we deliberate on projects that are coming before us. Give us wisdom, give us clarity, and I pray, Lord, above all, that we glorify you in everything that we say, do, and think. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Um, we note that I believe everyone is here tonight. There are no planning commissioners that are absent, so that is good. And we're going to begin tonight with a public hearing. It's a request by Tennessee Holdings to amend the Indian Lake Village Final Development Plan to add a multifamily residential uh, use to the list of permitted uses for Lot 46. And this property is located west of Indian Lake Boulevard and south of Saundersville Road, as identified by Sumner County Tax Map 145071.00. And the chair would note that there are uh, no uh, people signed up for that hearing, so I will declare that one closed. Um, item number four on the agenda tonight. Do we have any uh, requests for information assistance? Okay, hearing none. Additions to the agenda? Hearing none. We have the minutes from August 3rd. Do I have a motion? Motion. Move to accept by Mr. Altizer, uh, second by Ms. Silkwood. Uh, any any uh, discussion? Any abstentions? Okay, we've got one abstention. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, we have one abstention, that is Stringfellow. All right, then we move on to the final plats. We have Fountain Brook Phase 2, Section 2. Um, and uh, Grant, why don't you bring us up to date on that one? <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is the final plat uh, for Fountain Brook Phase 2, Section 2. And uh, this is uh, this is one they, they developer deferred this for a few months, uh, just uh, had a few things to, to address and uh, get straightened out. They, uh, they have agreed to all the staff comments on this though, uh, including re revising the construction plans for the uh, retaining wall to uh, be, some, be something that it meets our, our staff expectations and the expectations for the neighborhood. Um, and in addition to that, they must meet the pool agreement uh, for construction of the pool prior to, uh, prior to recording of the plat. So that's something else that we, we ensured that was uh, part of this, um, part of the approval of the plat that, that they would have to take care of all these things before getting it actually recorded. Okay, so they are agreed with all staff comments. Any yes, questions by the commissioners to uh, Grant or anybody else? So I have one question for Grant. So they can't start construction on these homes until that pool is started. That's correct. That's part of the pool agreement. They can't actually get even get it recorded, so they, they wouldn't be able to, to get the lots recorded to start. To Do they have to permit. finish the pool before they get started? I don't believe that's part of the agreement. Uh, I think that was they, they have to be substantially started and then have a surety in place uh, prior to. I think they have actually already have a surety in place. I'm not sure on the details of that. Keith may know more about. I just don't want to see it yes. halfway started and then don't. Don't yeah. finish. Yeah, and a little bit of the history of this without belaboring it. Uh, but this is a particular development uh, that was always supposed to have a pool, never got a pool. Um, um, back in 2008, when there was a whole slowdown of construction, uh, some different things happened, uh, and it never had a, uh, it never, they never constructed the pool. So what we've done is there's two sections, I believe, that are remaining. Uh, those sections have been bought out by another developer America of I think American family home rentals uh, has purchased the remaining uh, phases back there and what we've done is we've said we've said you've got to do all these different things in order to record the final plat so that we can make sure that this pool gets constructed um, you know really really the original deal from the previous developer in selling this property originally wasn't quite met. Uh, so where we're working on now is, is we'll just be working with the, the new developer uh, in trying to make sure, not trying to, we will make sure uh, that the pool gets constructed. 
So probably what will happen is that once the permit has been issued for the pool and the pool is well underway of construction, and I personally talked to whoever it is that's doing the pool construction and feel comfortable with the, the specific timeline that's laid out that the, that's going to be going to happen, uh, then I'll release the recording of just that first phase, and then they can go ahead and get a certain number of permits, and then we will probably, for that first group of permits, we'll probably hold up the certificate of occupancy uh, before those can be occupied, depending on where we're at with the pool. And, uh, and then continue, hopefully it all continues uh, fairly well. But at this point, just to note uh, that at this point, the permit has not been issued for the, uh, for the pool. But all the approvals, I believe, everything's been approved. It's just they have not got the permit. But the land's kind of grubbed up out there. It looks like uh, maybe they're ready to start start doing something. But we're we're gonna we're gonna make sure that that's that's done. One thing I also I might note is that previous for older subdivisions like this, we did not get uh, surety for amenity. So if there was a gazebo or maybe a walking trail, maybe or a pool, that wasn't something that we necessarily got surety for. We got surety for landscaping. We got surety for um, for, for drainage improvements in the streets and things like that. Uh, but here over the last uh, three years, since this situation has occurred with this particular pool, then on any new developments, we do require surety on any new developments that would get approved. In addition to providing surety for an amenity such as a neighborhood pool with a development, we also are very specific about what phase will that pool be constructed and we won't allow the, the pool to be constructed in the latter phases. It has to be in the first or midway uh, so we can make sure that that gets, gets taken care of. So just that's probably more of an answer than you were looking for, but I kind of wanted to explain that to everybody because I think every, most everybody is aware of Fountain Brook and the pool and the, the, the poor folks out there that, that have lived out there for more than 10 years with the expectation that a pool would have been built by now. Thank you, Thank you, Director Free. Any other questions? Hearing none, do we have a motion to accept with all staff comments? Oh, Ms. Harbert makes the motion. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Stringfellow. So. Any more discussion? Ms. Beery, call the roll. Altizer? Yes. Coker? Yes. Hardcastle? Yes. Hardwick? Yes. Hasty? Yes. Longmire? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Silkwood? Yes. Stringfellow? Yes. And Jenkins? Yes. All right, that's all 10. Okay, thank you very much. We're moving on now to uh, Norman Creek, the final plat, phase 2B. Grant, turn it over to you again. <clears throat> thank you, sir. Uh, this is a, a, a development by Pulte. This is the last uh, portion of that development, uh, Norman Creek off of Anderson Road. Uh, this is phase 2B, and uh, the developer has agreed to all staff comments for this. Uh, we did talk about the cul-de-sac at the end of at Keats and trying to make a connection there, but uh, the developer to the south of that uh, was not going to make that connection, and uh, in, in, in looking at, at doing this, they, they, we've uh, decided that there is no there is no reason for, to, to provide an easement there to, to uh, connect to that eventually, So because there, there should never be no there should never be a connection made there. So, uh, but there is a connection at Macy to connect to the adjacent property in the future, um, as as per the FDP, and um, <clears throat> there are some slope issues as well that was contributed to the to the Keats connection that uh, might not be able to be able to be made. So, um, they have agreed to all the staff comments though, and and it does uh, does meet uh, what was part of the development plan. Thank you. Are there any questions about uh, the Norman Creek final plat? Okay, hearing none, do we have a motion to accept with all staff comments? So moved by Ms. Silkwood. Do I have a second? Second by Ms. Stringfellow. Any more questions? Ms. Beery, call the roll. Altizer? Yes. Coker? Yes. Hardcastle? Yes. Hardwick? Yes. Hasty? Longmire? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Silkwood? Yes. And String Stringfellow? Yes. And Jenkins? Yes. All right, that's all 10. 
All righty. Thank you. It passes. Moving on now to development plans. Uh, we've got the Forest Park. Um, and uh, Grant and Director Free, you're going to handle that, Grant. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, this uh, final development plan is based on the uh, preliminary development plan that's been approved for this uh, for Forest Park, and uh, it is substantially compliant with the preliminary development plan. They did make uh, a few changes to it uh, from the original plan. As you can see here, the, the street network is a little bit different, but uh, it actually is... Uh, has more connectivity with this uh, final development development plan. They changed the uh, types of of lots for a few of the uh, um, for a few of these. They've they've uh, amended that slightly, but uh, but not substantially. And uh, uh, one of the things they um, they did also increase the open space with this FDP proposal. And uh, it, it, everything does meet the uh, the requirements to to be approved for this. So um, uh, it does include that uh, connection with Norman Way from uh, Saundersville Road, and they've uh, this is something they they're also including turn lanes uh, on uh, a substantial amount of turn lanes on Saundersville Road and on uh, uh, for the connection with Norman Way there. As you can see, that's uh, they've got a, a dedicated uh, right-hand turn and a left-hand turn out of uh, Norman Way onto Saundersville, and then also a uh, dedicated right-hand turn uh, onto Norman Way and a dedicated left-hand turn onto Norman Way, so in, in opposite direction. So that that's, should uh, allow for enough stacking uh, for for uh, the traffic that that we anticipate to be on that road, and. Um, uh, I think everything else is uh, meets meets all the expectations that we had from the preliminary development plan approval. Okay, thank you, Mr. Green. Director Free, you got anything to add on this, or is that? Uh, yeah, I'll just add just I'll just add a little bit. Um, one of the things to to just to note, and you saw it in the staff report, and you saw it in the plans up there on the top right, where it's kind of a mauvish, pinkish kind of color with a white box. This was an area that, uh, from what I understand. The developers, through the process of the sewer easements, acquired additional property. Uh, this is not something that we're approving at this time. At some point in the near future, uh, the developer will come back and annex, uh, ask request for annexation of that small piece, uh, and then also go through the uh, plan development process for that. Uh, and so, I just wanted to, I just wanted to make a uh, make a note of that. Thank you. And, and just two other things that I might note that was also reflected in the staff report is that originally the pool, the pool amenity area for the for the for the development was more in the center, and now it's a little bit more up to the front. The empty nester uh, targeted empty nester area uh, was really more uh, to the uh, on this map would have been more to the top up near that pink area. And it's moved a little bit more to, and the amenity area there for that has moved a little bit more to the front. I just thought I would, uh, I would mention that. But we still get the, the full connectivity of the east-west collector uh, on on this. And then also one other just additional thing, because I always want to mention the money, uh, is within 90 days of approval of uh, the final development plan, the developer will provide uh, um, um, funds in the amount of. I believe it's about 313,000 uh, to the to the city for those offsite improvements, and that's just uh, uh, the first installment. The rest of uh, the rest of the funding will come uh, a little bit later. Some of that is as part of the building permits, and then some of it once the first plat is approved for the development. Thank you. Are there any questions, Ms. Silkwood? Just a quick question. Uh, Mr. Green, if you could, could you clarify a little bit and, and maybe elaborate on planning comment number four about the raised landscape medians um, at the Saundersville Road during construction phase? Um, whether it, they are still going to be built, it's just a question of whether or not they were built at the construction phase. Is that what that's saying? Could you just elaborate a bit? Uh, yes, uh, we were looking at that, and uh, if you look at the drawing they, they provided for the uh, turn lanes, uh, we, we were looking at that, and they're showing them to be striped out. Just, just, but this was really just a, a drawing, really, I think, to show the, the addition of the turn lanes, but not actually the design of the road. Um, 
necessarily. So what we were talking about was uh, potentially having on Saundersville Road just, just raised islands in the where the, the striped out area is, and uh, just just if it's feasible to do that, if it's safe, you know, to say uh, if it's not a hazard to have those raised islands there, we would like to have that option to uh, to ask for for them to do that because um, just just you know have to have a. a landscape median there I think would, would look nice but uh, we want to make sure that it's safe and it's feasible okay. okay thank you mr. green so it's basically still kind of up for discussion and it's not a for sure yet yes we, we just we just wanted to make sure that that was something that we could have that conversation about and and, okay. and uh, that we could bring up and, right. and uh, because that would be probably something that we would bring up at the the plat stage as well got it okay thank you so much thank you <coughs> thank you are there any other questions mr. Peterson thanks mr. chairman grant I'm looking at the cemetery up there on the left hand corner is there parking or is it accessible to the public or is there another access to that is that a can I, that just uh, I had some questions um, pertaining to that I don't believe that's been added to this but uh, I think the developer may yeah, let's get clarity from the developer on that why don't you just introduce yourself item. and can I see if we can answer that one yes Mike Stanton represent uh, 10 home sites uh, the, in this iteration before it was just access behind the lots but when we did this final design that is open space and that we did that little um, eyebrow there so that there could be some parking on that eyebrow and there is access back to the cemetery how much parking do you think there'll be there Mike it's there's no dedicated parking but that's as you can see there's not much loaded on that so it, it would be fine for somebody to go I think there's not gonna spend a lot of time there but Okay. But we did open it before. If you'd have seen the original plan, it really didn't have that eyebrow and didn't have it, the access was behind lots. And we revisited that and created this new plan. Okay, Does that answer the question, Mr. Peterson. Yes, it Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stanton. Any more questions? Chair would entertain a motion to approve with all staff comments. Mr. Altizer got a motion second. second second by Mr. Mr. Peterson oh, Ms. Coker I said okay Ms. Coker I didn't see it done yeah you waved your hand or something <laughs> second by Mr. Coker all right any more discussion hearing none Ms. Berry call the roll Altizer yes. Coker yes. Hardcastle yes. Hardwick yes. Hasty yes. Longmire yes. Peterson Silkwood? Yes. Stringfellow? Yes. And Jenkins? Yes. That's all 10. Okay, thank you. Next, we're going to go to the Indian Lake Village uh, Phase 3G Area 9, Lot 46. This is uh, uh, what the public hearing was scheduled for tonight. Um, it's an amendment and an add on use uh, to multifamily residential. And I think what we'll do here is, uh, uh, Timothy, go ahead and make a your comments and then if the developer would come and we like we want you to take some time and uh, and uh, and give us a presentation as well Timothy okay. uh, so this is a uh, 8.74 acre uh, tract of land that uh, off of Indian Lake Boulevard it's uh, on the back side of the Aventura apartments and uh, southwest of the shopping center that includes Hobby Lobby um, and is ILV West um, so that that current master plan allows uses such as retail office restaurants a vet clinic daycare things like that um, does not permit multifamily um, and currently building heights in that area are limited to three floors um, so on this uh, this proposed plan it's, it's a it's a FDP amendment and a request to add the use of multifamily dwelling to the list of allowed uses for that phase. Um, this is for uh, two buildings, it would be four stories each, and uh, it would be a total of 247 uh, multifamily rental units. Um, 
So the, the current FDP uh, imposes a limit of 600 rental units over all of Indian Lake Village plan development. All of those are built out, so there are no more rental units uh, remaining there. Um, so this proposal uh, is to increase the allowed number of rental units from, from zero to 247, all of those to be built within this phase 3G. Uh, so if, if this is approved um, tonight and at BOMA, then um, the, those 247 units couldn't be built anywhere else. They'd all have to be in this particular phase. Um, they have uh, proposed um, some off-site improvements. The first of those is at the intersection of the commercial access corridor in Saundersville Road, that the, court, the, the road that runs uh, or gives access to Sam's Club and the Twice Daily and the shopping center. So that, that's a two-way two -way stop intersection. Um, they are proposing um, some improvements there, and those are listed on page eight of your staff report, and I'll just read those briefly. Um, the first is to reconstruct the intersection of Saundersville Road at the commercial access road to a single lane roundabout with single lane approaches at all intersection legs. Uh, and then install right turn overlap phases for all approaches at the intersection of Indian Lake Boulevard and Saundersville Road. And then to in install an additional eastbound left turn lane at the intersection of Indian Lake Boulevard and Saundersville Road. Um, in the second, uh, they're, they're offering to build a trailhead for the existing greenway. Uh, it would be kind of there behind the second building. Um, and that would consist of a pavilion, uh, some dedicated parking for the trailhead, and then a, uh, a dog watering station. Uh, they are requesting a couple of waivers. The first of those is for parking. They are required to have 446 spaces they're proposing 112 of those to be off-site on the shopping center parking lot, on the existing shopping center, existing parking lot at the shopping center. Um, so the zoning ordinance requires, if you have shared parking, it requires the two, the two different uses that are making use of those parking spaces for those, the, the hours for those uses to be completely offset. So typically it would be a situation where you might have a church and a retail use um, where when the church needs it the retail is not in business when the retail needs it the church is not in use uh, here though um, it's not really clear you know, staff can't verify that the uh, those uses would be offset um, the uh, the retail uh, businesses there um, but obviously be making use of the parking lot mainly during the daylight hours and you would anticipate that the apartments would have decreased need of those parking spaces and then likewise at nighttime the apartments would have more demand for those parking spaces you'd expect that those retail uses would have less demand but obviously there's going to be some overlap there um, because this is a planned development the planning commission has the uh, the leeway to um, consider any extenuating circumstances and they have provided a parking study um, and that parking study shows that uh, if you assume 100% lease out of the existing tenant spaces um, at peak demand the shopping on, on weekends the shopping center would need a total of 290 spaces which would leave 150 free um, for shared use and of those 150 the applicants, applicants requesting 112 of those to be subject to a shared use parking agreement um, the second waiver they're asking for is in relation to building materials the Indian Lake Village Development Guide requires each side of a building to be a minimum of 65 percent brick and stone uh, the proposed these two proposed buildings on the fronts, they will have 13% uh, brick. On the rears, the, the rears would be facing the greenway. 
uh, those would be 16% brick, and then the remaining percentages would be party board or, or fiber cement board. And those percentages don't include any glazing. All the glazing and wall penetrations are taken out of those calculations. So whatever surface area is remaining, remaining left over from the glazing, that's where the brick percentage is applied to. So they're asking for a waiver to allow that 13% um, brick on the front and 16% and on, on the rears. Uh, they have agreed to all staff comments, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Witten, uh, I'm going to turn to Ms. Silkwood just in a second, but look, here's my first question. I'm going to go ahead and ask the developers to come up and prepare uh, to make your presentation, but I've been trying to rack my brain on when we approved Indian Lake Village way back when, the number 600 of the rental units. Uh, you were here during that time. Where, where did we come up with that number from? I was trying to remember how that all came down. Was that just a, uh, an arbitrary number that we picked, or was that a number that was based on some, some uh, zoning ordinance at the time? My recollection is that uh, it was somewhat arbitrary. I, I think the concern was that um, if the Planning Commission did allow uh, multifamily that did not want a bunch of multifamily right at the start. They wanted it to be staged out, spread out across the development. Um, and so that number, uh, again, I, I think it was somewhat arbitrary, but it, it was just a, a measure to kind of control sure. the proliferation of those, the number of units, and make sure that the original intent as a mixed-use development with, you know, plenty of commercial and office development uh, happened apace or, or ahead of um, multifamily. So it would be safe to say, seriously, that when we chose that number, that was a safeguard for us to make sure, but now that we're into the build-out as it stands right now, uh, the number 600 is not what I would call sacred. It, would just, it was just a... No, I, it, was not, it was not the result of some market analysis or anything like that. Okay, thank you. Ms. Silkwood. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Witten, are they also asking for a building height waiver as well? I thought I saw well, something in the that, packet about not that. Well, technically, what, what they're requesting is that, um, so, so the, the master plan um, designates certain phases, and then it designates areas, and each area has a height limitation. So the current area is area two, all, all area twos, have a height limitation of three stories. So that would include, you know, Sam's Club and the, sh and the Hobby Lobby Shopping Center and outlots along Indian Lake Boulevard. They're, they're proposing that this would, be, would become an Area 9. All Area 9s have a four-story height limitation. So if you grant them the switch from Area 2 to Area 9, then that building height would be permitted. So it depends on how you look at it. But you could be saying they're requesting a waiver, but not technically. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're going to hear from the developer now. So if you would, just introduce yourself and start where you want to start. Sure. Good evening, and thank you for having us. My name is Patrick Poole, and I am the Nashville market leader for Al Nyer. We are a regional developer uh, based out of Cincinnati, but our office is here in Middle Tennessee in Franklin. We develop all asset classes, multifamily being one of them, class A office building, industrial, as well as a uh, medical office. And we, can, we have a slideshow that we may pull up as well. But one of our most recent projects is actually here in, in the city of Hendersonville. We just completed recently the Vanderbilt Health facility, which was our second uh, project for Vanderbilt Health. And we are now working on number four for them uh, over, over the rest of 2021. They've been a great partner of ours and, and really goes to show the, the type of quality that we, we perform. We are a full in-house architectural design, build, and developer firm. Um, and we are really excited about this project. So thank you all for having us and, and thank you for, for learning about this project uh, up until this point. Just a quick note about the project itself, and then Josh is going to walk through some of the highlights. But 
we're here to introduce a proposed $50 million luxury multifamily development. It is currently located in the Indian Lake Village PUD. As Josh is going to describe, the site has been marketed over the last seven years for its current retail use. However, unfortunately, due to its lack of visibility and daily traffic, it has not had the activity that, uh, that other retail uses land has, has seen in the PUD and therefore has gone undeveloped. In addition to its site zoning, it is currently located adjacent to 17 acres of multifamily, being the Aventura uh, apartment complex, as well as the Greenway city-owned property and its, its other adjacent site is a big box retail. All of that combined, we believe its location within the PUD makes for a fantastic multifamily, luxury multifamily development. As you'll see in our site plan renderings, this project will far supersede any luxury multifamily that the city of Hendersonville currently has. Our target market is a high income demographic of young professionals and empty nesters that are really seeking and attracted to the walkability of Indian Lake Village, the Greenway access, and all the other nearby amenities within the city of Hendersonville. Al Nair has the experience and the capabilities to perform on this project. We, over the last five years, we've completed over 2,000 multifamily units, which half of them have been in the luxury submarket. We're constantly pushing the envelope of design as well as high-end amenity spaces to keep up with the fast-paced changes of the luxury multifamily market. Again, we couldn't be more excited about this project. I want to introduce the team because some of them are here today. As Josh is going to introduce himself, Josh is with Kimley Horn. He'll be acting as civil engineer and landscape architect of, of the project. Our architect and interior design team is a, a group called Dwell out of Atlanta. They strictly fo focus on multifamily development, especially in the luxury multifamily development. Al Nair, we are acting as developer. We not only will construct the project, but we also will be the long-term owner of the project and holder. Uh, and lastly, we also have Rob Horton and Stan Fields uh, here tonight. They are supportive not only in their role as the current owner of the property, uh, the declarant under the current PUD, um, and we also have been working and collaborating well with Jonathan Payne on behalf of Lake West Shops, LLC, who is the adjacent retail um, owner. So with that, I'll turn it over to Josh, and I'm happy to answer any other questions that you guys have. Great. Thanks, Patrick. And we'll bring him back up as well after I get done with my brief presentation if you got questions for him that I can't answer. I'm Josh Rowland with Kimley Horn. We've been helping with the entitlements and the design process so far on the project. Work closely with Timothy and Lauren. They've been a great help uh, to get us to where we are tonight. So thanks for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to back up real quick and just um, reiterate that this is a, a luxury project. Um, these are leased stack flats. It's a four-story project. It's, uh, as Patrick mentioned, there's not another project in Hendersonville like this. Uh, I, I think something similar might be the Lux, but we like to call this the Lux on steroids. Um, this is a, a high-end development. Al Nair has a great reputation. They build high-quality projects. Um, I've worked with them uh, on many different projects in the past. Tonight, I got off on the wrong button here. Let's see. There we go. Okay. I just want to hit on a couple of things. You've already met the development team. We want to talk a little bit more in detail about the site context, about some project statistics, about our architectural concept and then some community and economic benefits for the city of Hendersonville. Patrick already, already hit on Al Nair as a company and what they do and how they operate and gave you a little bit of a, a flavor for their uh, experience in the multifamily design uh, development category. Uh, as far as site context goes, there's a lot going on. Obviously, uh, Indian Lake Village is a uh, almost completely developed mixed-use master plan. It's a wonderful asset to the city. There's some great amenities, great shopping, great restaurants in this area. Um, this site, shown in yellow in the middle of the graphic, was originally intended for commercial, uh, kind of a phase two of the Hobby Lobby development. And as Patrick and the 10 Holdings Company have mentioned, it's sat vacant for um, at least for the seven years that they have owned the property. A lot of that has to do with visibility and traffic. Right now, if you drive it, the only time you can see this site is a quick peek as you're going over the bridge when you're at the very highest. There's 
uh, existing commercial uh, development, starting with the Twice Daily on the corner, um, some of the other uh, retail developments. There's a liquor store that uh, fronts along Indian Lake Boulevard. Um, there's the Papa John's along Saundersville Road, and you just can't see this site. And so the commercial uh, users are not interested and haven't shown interest. Um, a couple of the other more positive attributes are the existing infrastructure. This site is unique in that it is built around infrastructure that was designed for this development. It was designed for the highest and best use. The arterial roads were intended for commercial trip traffic. Um, and an interesting fact is that as we look at the trips generated by multifamily versus commercial, what we're proposing tonight is about 75% less than what the trips would be if it were a commercial use. So we know traffic's an issue. This project would actually uh, reduce uh, traffic on roads that were intended for a higher use in this area. Uh, another point to consider, these residents will be using this specific area heavily for their shopping, for their eating out, for their retail uses, and quite often will be getting right on the highway and heading into Nashville for work or in areas nearby. So a much, uh, much less of an impact to uh, city of Hendersonville roads and services. Uh, when compared to a site that might be more uh, interior to the city. <clears throat> uh, a couple of dots there on the screen, a green one and a blue one, those represent the locations for our proposed public improvements outside of the private development. Timothy mentioned the trailhead improvement, that's the green dot. We're going to enhance the existing trail connection from the Hobby Lobby Shopping Center uh, we're proposing a picnic pavilion, some signage, uh, some dedicated parking. Um, and then the blue dot is our proposed roundabout. In the submittal to staff, there's a, a pretty uh, detailed uh, graphic about the roundabout proposal. Uh, we understand that's a very dangerous intersection, that uh, an accident occurs there near uh, almost daily. Uh, there's 90 feet of pavement out there. There's multiple turn lanes. It can be very confusing to navigate. Um, it's only stopped in two uh, uh, directions uh, from the private drives exiting the commercial. Um, I found myself a little confused as I was uh, visiting uh, the site and trying to get in and out. Our, our proposal is to reduce the pavement uh, fairly significantly and turn that into a roundabout. Uh, there's the potential for some raised medians in the middle, uh, some enhanced signage. Uh, just really our goal is to make that project or that intersection safer. Uh, our est early estimates are roughly $250,000 for those improvements. Um, so those are the two public improvements that we're proposing as a part of this project. And then, you know, as I mentioned about the trailhead, uh, the Greenway being at this location is a great um, relationship for multifamily and residential uses as well. Folks can get out on the Greenway. It's a great walkable development in this area. So we, we see a lot of those more positive attributes of the site um, being a great indicator that a residential use would work well here. And running through some of the statistics that Patrick uh, hit on briefly, um, estimated average income for these uh, folks living at the project would be in the 125,000 a year range. Uh, those are supported by uh, what we see with the uh, residents at, at the Lux, uh, very similar Product type, we've got one and two bedroom units that lease for 1,300 to 1,800 a month, so average of about 1,500 a month. Um, this demographic uh, that we see is, you know, about 30% active adult, 55 plus, another higher, you know, 40% 40, 40 in the under 35 young professionals. Um, those folks have a high level of discretionary income. They eat out a lot. They shop more. Uh, they don't have, you know, some of the burdens of home ownership as it relates to insurance and home maintenance and that kind of thing. So it's a great group to be put right in the middle of a retail development, but that is that's seeing a little bit of uh, a little bit of vacancy right now. The current Hobby Lobby development has about 15% vacancy, and we know that the streets at Indian Lake Village also um, have some vacancy issues as well. So we want to inject some new life into Indian Lake Village and. Uh, we think that these uh, these residents will do just that. Uh, it's interesting to note that the vacancies in multifamily projects in Hendersonville are zero for the most part. Um, there's waiting lists for all of the multifamily projects that are out there right now. We see that in all the surrounding areas. 
<clears throat> as I mentioned, these are one and two bedroom only. We don't have any threes or fours. Uh, the amenities, the lease rates, they're just not conducive for a, uh, a family with children. Um, and the amenities kind of support that in large part. Uh, you'll see a lot of fire pits and pools and outdoor game areas. This is targeting those young and, and older active uh, residents. And Timothy mentioned uh, the density. Our, our project slightly moves the needle on overall density within Indian Lake Village from 16.4 to 17.5 units to the acre. So I wanna spend a little bit of time on the architectural concept because it's something we, we spent a lot of time on. Um, you know, we wanted to embrace the, you know, the natural uh, beauty and kind of outdoor qualities of Hendersonville. Being on the Greenway, uh, being a young, vibrant city, uh, we felt like a, a contemporary approach to this concept really uh, suited the project well. This is a four-story uh, project, so we've got two buildings that are each four stories tall. Um, these are high-end luxury buildings. They have all internal corridors, multiple elevator shafts. Um, we have parking uh, both uh, with detached garage and tuck under attached garages, so a lot of different lease opportunities for uh, garages as well. <clears throat> I just want to hit on the, kind of the nature of the contemporary design. It's light and airy. It has nice natural earth tone colors. Uh, I don't want to give the impression based on our variance that we're requesting uh, a variance in quality. Uh, that's exactly the opposite. Uh, in order to achieve this design concept, um, we came with a material palette that's slightly different from a uh, design guideline that's 20 years old that was more um, kind of written in the traditional design concepts where brick and masonry meant quality. Um, the advancement of cementitious siding, uh, we call it, you know, it's, it's the new hardy board. It's the same level of quality and durability as, you know, the, the type of lick and stick stone, if you will, that kind of masonry has progressed into. Um, we're able to achieve a much more dynamic design palette with that. We have um, different textures and colors of uh, masonry board. It's the same durability and same quality, and I think it lives better and longer than some of that thin set stone that you see used on projects these days. Um, something else to point out is these luxury uh, apartments require a, a luxury level of architecture, and you see that in the design with windows and doors. We have probably twice as much glazing on this project as a typical multifamily project would have. A lot of that's put right up at the front. I'm gonna click ahead real quick and show you a bird's eye perspective of the project. If you know, if we could all get up in the air about 100 feet and look down over from Indian Lake Boulevard into the project, you see the on the right side, you see the end of the Hobby Lobby Shopping Center, and then you see the front of our project that faces towards the shopping center. Um, our goal was to treat this portion of the building as a kind of a commercial character. So we have two story storefront glass we put all of our amenity space up along that front end so that it showed well. Um, what that does is it builds a street scene that really finishes off the commercial center nicely. It allows for kind of a, a nice termination to the shopping center as it transitions back into residential. And um, as I mentioned, we have 30% of our entire elevation is glass. It's big windows, big tall windows, big tall doors in all the units, and especially on the front of the building here. It's, it's, you know, you could compare it, you know, to the, our neighbor, the Aventura, and they're a very traditional breezeway, walk-up, uh, multifamily project, smaller windows, smaller doors. The reason our masonry percentage is less is because we have a lot more glass. And, and the design is really complemented by the different use of materials that are just as durable and just as high quality as stone or brick. <clears throat> we have over 5,000 square feet of indoor amenity space. You'll see common area meeting rooms. You'll see lounge areas with fireplaces, uh, entertaining kitchens and living spaces. You know, part of this clientele are folks that want to get out and be social. So there's places to do that. Uh, I think there's over 7,500 square feet of improved outdoor amenity space, luxury style pools. We'll have other courtyards with bocce ball and 
places to play other games, uh, grill stations, fire pits, pergolas. Uh, we'll have a dog park. Uh, so there's a highly amenitized uh, offering inside and outside the buildings. I mentioned the garage space. Let me hit on parking real quick. When we were doing our traffic study to study the intersection and those, and those trips, we also did a parking study and we counted the number of spaces that were being used in the Hobby Lobby Shopping Center. Um, we recognize today that we have a COVID issue and the project's not entirely leased at Hobby Lobby, um, but there are 365 spaces zoned for that and built in that shopping center and 102 were being used on a peak weekday and 129 were being used on a peak weekend day. We multiply that times 115% to account for COVID and to account for um, slightly unleased spaces. And there are still over 150 spaces that are unused. So shared parking is a common term, but these are actually unused spaces. We have an agreement with that shopping center owner that was happy to let us use some of those unused spaces, keep them maintained, you know, resurfaced, restriped, um, and share that parking uh, because it's not being used at this time. Uh, as a brief comparison, projects like this in Metro for this type of clientele are parked at about 322 spaces. Um, so just because your zoning ordinance says we need 446, we've seen projects very similar that don't need that many just based on how these uh, one and two bedroom units are occupied. This, these are a couple of sample uh, photos of outdoor amenities. As I mentioned, great indoor spaces, uh, nice amenitized outdoor spaces, resort style pools. I mean, these are the types of um, finishes we have to offer to get the types of rents that we'll be asking. And this is more technical, uh, but we wanted to be real specific about our ask here tonight. We've gone in and provided this to, to Timothy and to Lauren to show them exactly what the materials are and those percentages. It's not really important to get into the exact square footages and percentages, but we just want to point out the quality. If you look at those elevations, you can see the high amount of glass uh, and the great kind of mix of colors and textures and finishes to achieve this contemporary concept. So jumping back real quick, these are the two front elevations. If you're looking from the Hobby Lobby parking lot, those are the two front elevations that have the nice two-story glass. These are the typical side elevations. Again, every unit has large windows, large doors, great balconies. And you know we haven't skimped on design on all four sides of the building. Um, even though very few folks will see these except for the residents because you, even when this project's done, you'll kind of see the roof of it as you go over the bridge and around the site. But we, we still don't want to skimp on design and, and detail inside the project. So to hit on a couple of community and economic benefits, um, it's important to know that this type of a residence is different than a normal single family resident. They have a significantly uh, less of an impact on city services. As I mentioned, we have no new roads that are being built and handed over to you. So there's no new maintenance on roads. Um, many of the roads that access this property are private, so they're gonna be privately owned and maintained by uh, private entities. I mentioned we have 75% less traffic than the approved commercial use out there. <clears throat> City services such as trash pickup and limb pickup, not a part of this, so those are services that the city does not have to provide. And again, well, I don't know if it's been mentioned yet, but little to no school impact. Um, a traditional multifamily development has about 0.2 students per unit. We see significantly less than that on these types of projects with one and two bedrooms. I've already hit on some of these other points. Um, $50 million of, devel of development uh, investment locally. We're gonna have local contractors, we're gonna have local um, real not realtors, but just, you know, th that local investment in in the development of this project um, will we'll go on for you know, the years that the project's under construction. 
and just hit on one more time, that demographic that we have here is going to be right there at the heart of Indian Lake Village. They're going to be out there shopping at the grocery stores, dining out at the restaurants, shopping at the retailers, uh, giving a little jump start um, back to some of those businesses that have had such a tough time during COVID. Um, so just to conclude, a couple of points. I think Patrick mentioned a few of these. Hendersonville hasn't approved a multifamily project in over six years. Uh, I've heard it here, I've heard it in Mount Juliet, I've heard it in Lebanon, I've heard it in Spring Hill. Everybody's dealing with single family for rent and they all have the same um, issues that you all have. Um, you know, part of that is because, you know, they haven't been improving or approving multifamily projects either. And, and there is a, a time and a place for quality, high quality multifamily. We believe this project is right for the city of Hendersonville um, and it will help mitigate some of the impacts to that single family for rent that's happening. If you give high quality rental opportunities, less of that will occur out in the areas where you don't want to see it. Um, you know, this is a smart growth project. It builds on existing infrastructure. I think that's, you know, one of the, the best points we can make here is these roads were built in an Eden Lake Village for development and we're close to the highway, which means these residents will be not taxing your roads and services uh, nearly as much. Um, Timothy helped answer well the question about 600 units and why that number was picked. That was picked 20 years ago based on assumptions at that time. I think what we're discovering here in Indian Lake Village is that, um, you know, this commercial area needs more heads and beds, if you will. They need folks that are out there using that area on a day-to-day -day basis. So we feel like as we're catching up to the end here and figuring out what the right balance is, this is a slight adjustment to make that balance a little more equal. Um, and, and again, you know, this comes, really comes down to lifestyle choice. Uh, we've heard folks that are, you know, building a new house and need six months to rent a place and they have certain expectations. Uh, young professionals who are just too busy and not willing to buy a house and maintain and deal with that and they'd rather have a place where they can go and hang out with friends in the courtyard or um, meet new friends by the pool. Uh, empty nesters who are tired of maintaining a house and don't want to deal with that anymore. Um, so there's, there's a time in life uh, for leased residential development. We feel like this project will be a great addition to the city of Hendersonville. Certainly appreciate your time and letting us get into the details a little bit. We're here to answer any questions that you have tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, we're going to go ahead and open it up here for any questions or comments, and I'll go ahead and, and start. This is an interesting project. Um, I would note, first of all, on any kind of thing like this where we recommend to BOMA, obviously we look at density, we look at uh, impact on roads, uh, we look on adverse effects um, around the neighboring areas. So those are the things we kind of look at when we're looking at an added use, that kind of thing. So. You know, just to kind of go down the row here on the density issue, you know, we're, we got Contare, which uh, is 25.8. You're requesting 28.4. That's a little variance, but the overall density of the cap still uh, is below the 17.5 cap. So that makes sense. On the traffic, uh, if you take the, the engineering that was done on the commercial site alone, it was engineered for that kind of traffic, as you've mentioned. So, you know, I, I see that. We do have a small uptick because there are going to be a, an additional amount of vehicles. Um, the one question I have, and I don't know if this is a public works question or somebody from your team, the roundabout is a, is a great idea. It's a fantastic idea, but the proximity of that roundabout from the intersection of Indian Lake Road, um, that's not that far away, and I, I've definitely seen stuff that's even closer than that, but do we have, I mean, that's a pretty busy intersection. Do we have any kind of estimate on, on people that are going to make a right turn in off of, for example, off Indian Lake or a left turn off of Indian Lake Road? coming back towards Sam's, of yep. how that's going to impact uh, 
Yeah, if you have any issues with insomnia, you can get our traffic study because it's like 150 pages of exactly that information. Uh, what, what I don't we want found, 150 pages. I just want like <laughs> the Cliff Notes version of <laughs> what what we found was one of the biggest problems of that intersection. They were the um, I guess that would be the eastbound or northbound left turn off of Saundersville Road going north on Indian Lake Boulevard. That's what was causing the biggest failure to that uh, to, to the intersection that we're talking about was folks would stack up at that left left northbound. Uh, access out onto Indian Lake Boulevard and block the intersection. Um, so our proposal is to simplify the commercial intersection and add a left turn lane to the Saundersville Road and Indian Lake Boulevard. And I apologize, I, I thought we might have some of those graphics available tonight and I didn't include it, but we have a full graphic showing that roundabout study. Um, yeah. Timothy, do you have any comments on on uh, staff's uh, take on this? I can share Keith, that would be great, too. Yes. Yeah, I had um, uh, Sarah Locke, uh, our uh, uh, acting public works director. Uh, she was not able to be here uh, this evening, uh, but I did speak with her. And, and so what she said about the roundabout is that I do think the roundabout is a good recommendation to improve safety. Uh, through that area without adding another traffic signal to the system uh, without adequate separation, which that can introduce new safety concerns with spillback uh, from, um, uh, from a new light uh, and can also add to unnecessary delay uh, in, that, in that traffic pattern. So uh, that's, that's, that's what she said on that. Uh, we don't, you know, we've got the concept of this at this point. We don't necessarily have construction plans. That would be something that would have to come later, uh, but those construction plans would be reviewed by our uh, public works department uh, to make sure that they meet all of uh, our expectations. But at this point in concept, she's the public works director interim yeah. is, says it would be fine. Yes, that it would be, it would be an a, a improvement over what's there, especially versus putting a light there, yeah. you know, which is what probably, probably nine out of 10 people that are on one side or the other, ready to take their hands and their lives in their hands to cross, probably are saying, "Hey, I wish there was a light here." Um, but that's, but the light, but the light would, and understandably, the light would create its own set of problems being that close right. uh, to the to the intersection where a roundabout has the ability to flow a little better. Well, at, at present, uh, as you probably noted, I mean that parking lot over where Hobby Lobby is can get full. But the Sam's parking lot is has m much more traffic. So well, and, and one of the benefits of a roundabout is it keeps flow continuous. It doesn't force people to stop and things to bottleneck. It allows it one. It slows people down, but it keeps that pace continuous. Yeah. It has some positive ripple effects. We've got a, a greenway crossing a few hundred feet to the west of the intersection. We we've been told that folks are racing pretty fast across that pedestrian crossing. We add new signage, we have the roundabout, people are slowing down because I've got to navigate around a roundabout. So, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of positive uh, okay. benefits. All right, that's all the questions I have for right now and comments. So any other commissioners? Just, I just wanted to thank you guys for all the, the hard work that you've put into this. And, and I'd like to follow up a little bit about what they've said. Commercial real estate is what I do for a living. The, where we specialize is retail and office. And because of where this lot sits, it's not going to be retail anytime soon. So it, while I'm typically not in favor of doing a lot of multifamily developments, I think this lot works, and it's one that we should approve. Any other commissioners? Mr. Peterson. Um, yes, Mr. Chairman, full disclosure, I met with the developers last week because um, I had some concerns about this project as well, and I do have a couple follow-up questions. I am concerned about the shared parking with the, the development, uh, the retail, and the proposed greenway traffic head, uh, trailhead. Um, I, I just don't know if that's enough parking spaces. 
And uh, I'll let you answer that, and I have a follow-up question. Uh, based on our analysis, we feel very comfortable with the proposal. Uh, we have talked at length and shared our proposal with the property owner, and their tracking of the use of their parking lot is consistent with our study. As I mentioned, there's about 360 spaces there today, and a quarter of those are being used during this somewhat of a dip in, in commercial and um, uh, vacancy timing right now. Our, our counts were taken in July, so it was when everybody was getting back out and shopping again, and our traffic counts were actually consistent with what we were seeing pre-COVID. So when you relate that with commercial usage, I don't feel like we were too far below what would be the norm. And again, we were counting 122 spaces being used during peak shopping hours on a weekend, which is the peak of the peak. But we went ahead and said, okay, multiply that times 2.15. And there were still over 150 spaces, what we're calling unused. And we need 112 of those unused spaces. And the current commercial developer was happy to enter into an agreement with us to do that. Okay. Uh, and my follow-up is, um, why did you decide to have a leasing development as opposed to condos that would be for sale? Uh, you know, again, it's, it's the lifestyle choice. There, is, there are zero available units for leasing, and there are always folks for various reasons that are looking for exactly that, especially these luxury flats. And, Patrick, did you want to touch on any of the demographic? Well, just from the, <clears throat> the condo market in general has, has been slow in the suburban setting to begin with. Um, the, this price point really equates to a, a higher than entry level market. So, for instance, the, this demographic would, in that $1,300 to $1,800 a month in rent range, would really be able to afford somewhere between a three hundred and a $425,000 single family house, townhome, condo, et cetera. That market for condos is, is frankly not here in Hendersonville just yet on the condo side. That's, that's a pretty steep condominium price point as compared to where the average single family home is uh, for new construction is in, in the city of Hendersonville. So really it's market demographics for one. Um, and then secondly, the on the flip side, the opposite is true on the multifamily side. The luxury market in multifamily in Hendersonville is has absolutely zero vacancy. It has zero vacancy for all multifamily. And other than the Lux, which we mentioned earlier, we don't believe there is another product like this in the city of Hendersonville. So it's going to be extremely unique for not only the city, but frankly for, for the suburban market all around surrounding areas of Nashville. That's what I was about to go to the Absolutely. Absolutely. Make sure you introduce yourself yep. for all um, TV land. You know. Rob Horton with 10 Holdings, one of the owners along with Stan Fields. Um, the Gatherings is a, a for sale condo project that is in Indian Lake Village. Um, it's just at the front of the Ashcrest development next to the, the three-story uh, office building that was built, kind of a one of the original buildings built in Indian Lake Village. Um, the... We sold that land to the builder that is building that project. They also put this land under contract at the time to be a potential second phase, depending on how that went. Um, the takedown of that has not been as quick as they would have hoped. The market does not seem to be as deep as they would have hoped, and they let that contract lapse probably a year to a year and a half ago um, and they've not come back since um, so I think that that along with the fact that we've been marketing it for seven years with looking for a retail user um, I think if you go out and you look at the site from the surrounding road you'll see that there just is no visibility to this site uh, primarily blocked by the three-story apartment buildings of Aventura that align that uh, line in Indian Lake Village. Um, so we've tried that. We've tried. We've had several of the uh, hotel developers 
approach us about property we have further down Saundersville Road to the east uh, near the stop 30 intersection. We have property there. Um, we've had hotel users uh, kind of pre-COVID kicking the tires of looking at some of those sites. Um, we have always tried to redirect them to this site first just because we thought being in the middle of more action would be a more desirable position to them. But I think for a hotel, they're looking for more uh, visibility along uh, Vietnam Veterans Boulevard. Uh, so we've tried hotels, we've tried retail. Um, and then, like I said, we've had it under contract also uh, with a stacked, fat, stacked flat for sale condominium builder. Um, and all of those have fallen through. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Ms. Silkwood. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I've heard you say that, you know, you've tried to get commercial and retail there as well as hotels. Um, but one thing I think we need more of in Hendersonville is actually corporate property, a corporate campus, a corporate headquarters. Um, has anyone tried to get a corporate campus at head or headquarters in that location? Because, you know, you're talking about trying to reinvigorate that shopping center and obviously all the apartments that surround that shopping center has not reinvigorated the shopping center. Why would we think that more apartments would reinvigorate the shopping center when a corporate campus would actually bring people from outside of Hendersonville to Hendersonville to do their shopping? Yeah, um, don't disagree with anything you're saying there. Um, retail restaurants generally follow rooftops. I mean, that's kind of a general saying in real estate. Um, having corporate office, any office that creates a lunch crowd for restaurants is also, you know, very healthy for restaurants and for retail. Um, we have about 20 acres located. Uh, it would be right where the uh, Stop 30 Road overpass is over um, Vietnam veterans. Uh, so it's the corner, it's the property in between Saundersville Road along Stop 30 and Vietnam veterans. Um, that is zoned for a corporate office campus. We've got a uh, conceptual layout for three one, six story, 100,000 square foot buildings, 1,200 parking spaces, uh, along with a little bit of retail on the corner of Stop 30 and Saundersville Road. Uh, we bought that property in 2012. So we've been marketing it for nine years. Um, I can count on one hand the number of uh, official proposals that have come from the, like the Tennessee Economic Development Office for uh, corporate offices that are relocating from other states or other cities potentially, but mostly from other states um, that we've been able to propose on. Uh, we've never made it to the final cut on any of those. Um, I'm you know, not sure exactly what the reasons are. We don't really get feedback to say why we get cut from the list. Um, but in talking to Rod and others that are involved in economic development, you know, the, the first thing they're looking for is available, available um, job force, so a workforce. Um, and so I don't know if that cuts us out. We've been a bit we're known to be an anti-growth city, so I think that it is did not helpful to attract those types of employers. Um, and so it, I, I don't really know why we haven't gotten it, but you know that is an ideal site that we would love to have. We have told Jamie, we've told Rod that you know uh, people like Barry tell us, hey, if you guys go build a building, you know we can fill it. Um, but to build a 100,000 square foot building is a really big bet. And we say, you know, show us a 30,000 square foot user and we may, we may take that chance that we go ahead and build the building and see if we can fill the other 70,000. No one's been, ever been able to bring that tenant to us. Um, so yeah, we're, we're working it. We would love to find that. Uh, that would be the big win. And I, I, we all tend to agree that if we could just land that one first big corporate employer, it could then, you know, spark a chain reaction and bring others. But 
to this point, we just have not had success. We also own the um, Wyndham Professionals building that's right next door to the Hendersonville Library. Um, it's 24,000 square feet, set up mainly for a call center, um, and it's it ready to go. I mean, it is move-in ready. And we've been marketing it for nearly a year now. We've had a couple of um, potential prospects come through the Tennessee Economic Development Office, but again, have been eliminated as finalists on all of those. And that's even sitting with a building ready to go. Um, so office is just weak here. Right? I, but office is probably weak everywhere due to COVID. Um, and there's probably gonna be some reset, like how much more office is immediately needed in our country is probably very debatable right now because lots of people went home to work. We don't know exactly how many are coming back. So it could create some vacancies that companies that are moving around could immediately fill rather than building more new. So that's been a really weak market for us that we would we wish would strengthen because we would love to build some some buildings to put those in. Mr. Hardwick. Ms. Silkwood, may I answer your question from a different perspective? Because sure. I think what you were, well, I shouldn't be so presumptuous, but would that, if we give up that piece to go multifamily, do we still have available land for an office campus? And the answer, he gave you one for the 20 acres that they own. I was 20 acres, correct? Yes. But there's also several others. You have the, the Beatty Farm. That's a, the location. You have the Davidson Academy land. Or Beatty Farm, I'm sorry, I got my names wrong. Yeah. What's the farm that we just did the Publix by? Not, see, I'm still getting it wrong. The chicken place, Popeyes. What, what's the farm? No, the Chenault Farm, thank you. So you have that one. You have their land. You have the Davidson Academy land on the other side of Vietnam veterans. You have the land by behind Aladdin's. So there are several, there's, there's four or five still good places that you could do a really nice campus development in the city. We, we've done those analysis for folks, and there's at least four or five that would work and would work better and be a better alternative than this site would be. Thank you. I'll be happy to get you those locations if you'd like sure. them. Thank you, Mr. Hardwick. Um, yeah, I, 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 it's a good discussion, and I think that, Rob, you mentioned something that I think is worth pursuing. It's not pursuant to this particular submittal, but it is the question that I think all of us need to grapple with, and that is, why are they saying no? What, what, is, what is it? Is it the price point? Is it location? Is it proximity to downtown? What is it that we were trying to deal with and you know that's not alone for this board or this commission to make presumptions on we can have our own opinions I think but I, I, I would recommend that all of our elected officials and boards uh, we need to focus on this because this is important um, we all want a, a greater community and I, I do I do take take the council on uh, the class A office space especially you know, uh, pro post COVID with so many companies that are retaining the right to say work at home for a while, you know, is there going to be that need? I don't think we know that yet, but, um, it does bring to bear some good questions. And then Mr. Hardwick follows up with some great comments on additional, uh, campus spaces that are available. So thank you. Uh, any more questions, Mr. Coker? Yes. Rob, I just wanted to thank you and your team for the presentation that you made here tonight. I appreciate the way that you've approached this from the beginning. I appreciate y'all reaching out to us one-on-one. -on -one. I know I've burned you up with questions, and I apologize for that, but it's been very helpful for me. It's an example of the right way to go about doing this for the ask that you're asking. Um, I see a lot of benefit to what you're doing um, or what you're proposing here, and I've, I've wrestled with this because I'm like Barry. I tend to disfavor multi multifamily um, developments. There was something said in the presentation tonight that I think helped make up my mind for me on this, and I, I think I owe you all an explanation for this. There was Mitch and traffic getting on the bypass and going into Nashville. I am very blessed that I don't have to do that in the morning, but about 70% of this city does, and I don't think that we, 
it is a nightmare. It is a nightmare for people who have to drive downtown in the morning to go to work. And this is obviously not a problem that you can fix, but until that infrastructure is done, I love the way this project looks. I think that there is going to be a need for it. I don't think the city's ready for it yet. And so I'm a no based on timing on that, but I want to appreciate every, I want to say thank you for everything that y'all have done because you've approached us the right way. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coker. Ms. Silkwood. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just following up on what Mr. Coker said, so I too appreciate you all reaching out to us one on one. I think it's a beautiful project. Um, I, I, there's a lot that I do like about it, but I will not be supporting it, partly because we, you know, we, we're talking about we need more residential, more rooftops. We have 626 some odd uh, residential units have yet to be built at the Forest Park. Uh, subdivisions hasn't even broken ground yet on that so we've got that coming to help bolster our rooftops here in, in Hendersonville and I feel very strongly that when this Indian Lake Village was approved if rental units had exceeded 600 and if residential units had exceeded 1200 it probably wouldn't have passed and it definitely wouldn't have been palatable for the community so for those reasons I will vote no thank you Ms. Silkwood Ms. Longmire yes well for full disclosure I want to let everybody know that I also had met with the developers earlier this week. But I have a couple of other questions. Um, a point of clarification. If this um, change were allowed, will it be restricted to this lot only? Yes. And from a history standpoint, if something happened to another building, let's say the Hobby Lobby burned down, okay? So that land becomes available will they be able to come back to us and say well you approve this over here we want to change i just would like to know that it would have to be a whole process mr free why don't you answer that one yeah that, that would be that would be a whole process to to change that from uh already being established commercial and then changing that on the development plan it had to come back through a detailed process to do that um, you know, of course, anything at Indian Lake, even if it has a building on it, it could come back through some process, yeah. you know, regardless if it burned down or not. But yeah, that would, that would be, that would be, that'd be a detailed process that anything would have to come back to the So future. this is going to, if it were to pass, this would go through as an allowable use for that specific lot? Only. Yes. This, okay. this, uh, yeah, this specific lot only. Okay. So they, it wouldn't allow multifamily or any yeah it wouldn't allow multifamily anywhere else uh it would just allow it on that specific spot with with this uh concept that they're talking about and i have another question i want to talk about the shared parking um i'm assuming that with these upscale uh units that you are proposing there's parking there but it's not assigned parking is that correct Nope. So it's like a first come, first serve. If I get home before you get home and I get the parking place, it's mine. Yeah, with, with the exception of the garage units. That's right. Okay. And how many, you've got 257 units proposed? 247. 47. And how many um, garages have you got? More or less. I 80. Don't know. 80. 80 spots. No, let, me, let me check my math. I've got it Is right Is each here. garage a two car or one car? One car. One car. Seventy, seventy-nine. I was one off. <laughs> Shame on you. Um, so that that when they. When they come home, they may just decide that they want to park out in the shared parking because they don't want to drive around, find everything's filled, and I mean that possibly. And and the way, the nice thing about the Hobby Lobby Center is there's a big chunk of parking, way off to the end that's not in front of any of the stores, and that's most likely the spaces that are getting used the very least. And least, and we're able to. Uh, that's almost the perfect number of spaces for what we're requesting. So they're going to be near the multifamily. Uh, if you were to compare it to another multifamily project, they'd be no further than a typical parking space. But they're, would be. they're not going to, again, they can park anywhere in that area. 
Yes. It's not going to be an assigned shared area. Yeah, we haven't gotten into the nitty gritty with the agreement with the uh, Hobby Lobby uh, owner. There, there may be some specific signage that says these spaces are reserved for residents of uh, the Indian Lake Village multifamily project. But again, I think it's going to be adjacency. They, you know, they'll, they'll park as close as they can yeah, because they obviously. won't want to walk any further than they have to. And then they can come out and walk on our green space. <laughs> um, I may add one, one point. In, in part of Josh's slide, there was a, a little footnote about just the parking ratio in the city of Hendersonville. It is substantially high compared to the current markets we're also operating in. So in, in comparison to Davidson County Metro, you, and that's a good slide right there, you can see that for the density we're, we're proposing, the city of uh, Nashville, Davidson County would only require 322 spots, of which those would all be contained on this parcel itself. So, and where those numbers come from, and I think it's relevant when we talk about the unit mix we have here, in Metro and Williams County and some of the other adjacent suburban uh, districts, there's typically a one per one u uh, bedroom parking ratio, whereas the city of Hendersonville requires a one and a half per one bedroom. And similarly with the two bedrooms in, in Nashville, there's a requirement of one and a half parking spots per two bedroom, whereas the city of Hendersonville requires two and a half. Um, that goes up as you get into three bedrooms. Our unit mix here is substantially uh, catered to young professionals and empty nesters. So we have a really high density of one bedrooms and two bedrooms. We have removed all three bedrooms. So what in essence is going to happen is you're going to have much less families. And we talked about that as far as the lack of impact on schools, but it also has an impact on parking. We're going to have just a lot less cars. What you see in urban settings right now in, in a lot of the tertiary urban markets in multifamily is, is parking ratios of 0.85 total parking spots per one, one bedroom. We, of course, are not coming to the city of Hendersonville asking for a decrease in the parking requirements, but instead it's just a, a little footnote to, to make a point that we've, we don't truly believe that the shared parking will be utilized as often as it may be being portrayed here. We believe that for the most part the residents will be able to park on our parcel to begin with. Can I me jump point out something on on this slide? If you look at the far right corner of the the picture, the top right corner, mm -hmm. that's the end of the Nest um, retail shop, and you can see there's there's two more bays of parking before you get to the black dotted line that would be the actual site for this multifamily project. Those two bays there are where most of the shared parking comes from. And if you go over there at any point in the day, you will rarely ever see a car in either one of those two bays. Yeah. It's, it, one, there's more parking than, than is needed, and two, it's so far away from the retail that anybody going and patronizing the, the retail are just not parking that far away. But those two bays exist today, and then everything to the left of that is what would be constructed on this site. Thank you, Rob. Anything else? Yes. Okay. Um, I want to address the building materials. Um, part of this is so I can understand a little better. I know that materials change. I'm in the real estate business and have been for many years. I don't know the projection of what they've done to change Hardy Board from when it first came out what the projection is for how long it lasts, for any kind of maintenance it may or may not need. I, I'm not up on that. I'd like to know what you can tell me about that because I think I'm kind of known as the brick lady. Uh, it, it looks real good in Williamsburg today and it looked good when it was put there. And it's real hard to convince me other than looking for a different look. Now, I think what your design is like is very nice. Um, but I'm just wondering, what is the what, what if anything do you have to do for maintenance to Hardy Board? Well, this Hardy Board is the, the Hardy Board treatment that we're proposing will either be a a permanent finish when it's installed. We've got some that have a wood grain texture, and then we have others that are painted. And um, you know, the the Hardy Board material itself, I believe, has a 30-year warranty. Life and 
you know, Patrick, step up and correct me uh, if I ever misspeak here. But a, a project of this quality and character will have its own maintenance kept up. You know, it will be repainted as time goes by. It'll be recalked. But th this uh, cement board, uh, cementitious paneling, as it's referred to, will be either um, formed in the factory with a color and a finish, or it will be painted. And we also have a high percentage of stucco and, and uh, masonry on some of the ground level elevations as well, where you can get up close to it and see it and, and touch it and really appreciate it. And I'll add a little bit more to this. Um, so Stan and I are also the mm -hmm. architectural mm -hmm. review committee for Indian Lake Village. We're the declarant. And so any project, whether it's our property or anyone else's, has to come through us first for an architectural review, and then it, it comes on to you guys. One of the things where, and, and so the brick, I, I get the concern with brick is durability. You know, it, oh. it's longer term. It, it wears is a, well. Wears well. Um, the issue we're starting to have now is, and if you take the uh, Fairfield Inn project yeah. as, as an example, is they're trying to get, the, the architectural appeal now is trying to get a lot of variation and, you know, building, uh, walls that jut in and out that cantilever and overhang and and so sticking bricks to the side of or trying to get a brick to to uh, stay on a uh, portion of a wall that's cantilevered there's not enough support to hold real brick on the side of the wall and so what we're seeing for uh, Fairfield in in particular to get around this high brick percentage requirement that we have in Indian Lake Village is they're using what Josh mentioned earlier, the lick and stick. So it's it looks like a brick, but it's about a like half a inch thick, and I, it's just stuck to that wall. Is it similar to a paver? Um, it's the pavers are pretty thick, you know, and, and to well, the, be able to drive on. But but they look just like a brick, and they do have some mortar mortar in between them. But they're, ri patio. they're literally just paper. stuck to. Much thinner, you know, like uh, Rob mentioned, it's, about a half an inch thick. But it, it's just like if you took a brick and just cut off the front of it mm -hmm. and made it about a half inch thick and then stick it to the wall and put some some uh, mortar in between and then stick another one on, it looks like you have a brick wall, but you don't have a real durable brick wall. And over time, those things shake loose and fall off. And so we're forcing people to have brick as an exterior. Um, and the way they're getting around not putting real brick on is using that product that over a 30 year span of time, maybe more of a maintenance nightmare than what Hardy would be that is permanently affixed that creates that wall. Um, so while having this high brick requirement I think the initial intent was the durability and the you know the long-term viability of projects. We're seeing because people want the architectural appeal that a large percentage of brick can't create, they're finding other ways to create it with products that may not be as durable as the hardy and other cement type products that are available on the market now that didn't exist when these design guidelines were created almost 20 years ago. Well, it does bother me that your request is to allow 25% and 10%. That's a whole lot less than the 65 that we originally. Another thing that's codes. that's different with this project than most others. If you take up Sam's wholesale that has a large amount of brick, you know, forced to have a large amount of brick on their building, there is almost no. Uh, windows and doors on it. So you've just got these large brick walls that, you know, it's great that they're brick, but they really don't look nice. Um, you take a project like this, and while let's say that that elevation only has 25% brick, if you look at the amount of storefront glass, and these are the things Stan and I are looking at and considering as an architectural review committee, if you look at the amount of glass that's used on that front, which is more expensive than doing brick and far more appealing, especially the two-story glass. 
why we and, and we didn't create these design guidelines we took over that development later after all of that was created and it's it's raised the question do we need to reconsider the way these design guides are written written in their requirements but when you look at something like this and you see the amount of glass that's on the front that is more expensive than brick it, we're asking ourselves why wouldn't we include the the 30 percent of glass that's on that front along with the 25 percent of brick why wouldn't we just consider that 55 percent covered with a really high-end durable product that creates a much you know prettier elevation than if you go look at any of the buildings in there the streets that uh, the um the movie theater you know, the strip centers you know they all have a little bit more glass but they're, they're just primarily flat brick buildings so this it's hard to we're going to have a really difficult time allowing projects that look this nice with the design guidelines as they are today so we either have to grant variances or rethink the design guidelines which is one of the things we're we're talking about well i'm not real big on variances i mean if you got to give a whole lot of variances you, you should look at what your rules are. exactly but when you have the rules i kind of think you should follow the rules and uh, i'll ask you one other question and, and i agree with that unless you get an inferior end result and for us as an architectural review committee and having a large investment in a lot of remaining land we want it to look as nice as it can look and prop up the values of everything that comes in the future um, it just I, I agree you know we all want to have rules we can can always live by but if you get an inferior product in the end we have the right set of rules and that's so that's the question we're asking ourselves anything else Ms. Longmire yeah one other question um, what is the cost to use the materials that you want to use versus if you weren't making any of these variations okay. I'm gonna turn that over to one of them because I'm not the builder I'm not asking for a specific amount I'm just saying a, approximately I just a, a good comparison to make would be the the thin set brick uh, that Rob mentioned versus this cementitious panel they're both manufactured in the same way and they both cost the same it's just a different use of the same material and the labor uh, they all have to get up on four-story scaffolding and and install it and so you're and saying it. it's the same it, it is they make some the cementitious material to look like brick as well correct that's right but uh, what product are y'all using I'm not the architect, so uh, we haven't we haven't chosen a specific material uh, manufacturer yet. But I would add to it on the brick versus the cementitious material that's been proposed here by our architect is the one is is really aesthetic in nature. If this was a fully brick uh, facade on all four corners to meet the requirements, it would give off a, a much different look than than the de desired appeal. When you're talking about a four-story structure like this it, it well, this is more contemporary looking definitely more contemporary but even from a, uh, a softness perspective uh let's pr pretend it was red brick if, if you were to develop a red brick four-story building it would really have more of an industrialist look a more urban setting look which was far from where our architecture team wanted this to to appear their aim was to connect it with the city of hendersonville with indian lake village tie in the greenway tie in the lake use soft colors and soft materials um, which again going with the full brick would, would really deviate from that design so it, I guess I'm answering a loaded question here it's more than just cost in your opinion well just from the developers perspective on on the reasons why we we altered from or are requesting the variants that we're requesting thank you I've had enough miss miss Stringfellow Thank you. Um, I, I just want to let you know, uh, I think that uh, this is really nice. Um, I really appreciate you going into the details and um, it is a change for Hendersonville to have the windows, but I personally like the windows. Not that I'll live there. <laughs> I would make me want to live there, but um, there's places in Nashville that I know that um, 
has the glass and it really does look nice. Uh, the other thing about traffic uh, with people working downtown, since I no longer work downtown, I retired, so um, the traffic was terrible. But then during COVID, we did work at home. And uh, the few times that I did have to go into the office, it wasn't near as bad as it was going in five days a week. But to say that, um, where I work, the buildings that we have were very, I mean, they were paid for already. They're looking at moving people into smaller uh, offices to and sell the buildings. Um, so it may be that this would be a place for people that could work at home. And I know the lobby area is really sounds nice. So I would support this project. That, Thank that, you, that's a, a good point. I, I would just say, and I apologize, Commissioner Coker, that my comment about traffic going to Nashville is what turned you off. But um, these, even the one bedroom units have a study or a den. And we even find a lot of folks wanting getting the two bedrooms, get it for a, a home office. You know, I, uh, we have co-working spaces in the amenity areas. These units are really set up for folks that are nearing retirement and work from home a lot, young professionals that are doing startups or have the ability to work from home. I mean, that's, that's who we see as the demographic here. Thank you. Um, there's no other questions here. I would, let me just kind of close and then we're gonna, we need to get some clarification as to what we need to do here with uh, the motion. But, you know, the first thing is um, the guidelines that were written 20 years ago, they suited 20 years ago. And, you know, I think it's, it's time for us to take a look at what we're doing. Um, and I say that because of kind of what both Stringfellow, Stringfellow said. I mean, when you look at other properties that are around um, different counties, um, you know, uh, to, to make the assertion that because this looks the way that it does, that it's not going to be as durable or, or long-lasting, I don't think is correct at all. Now, had you said that many years ago with relation to vinyl siding, you know, where you can now see years later where vinyl siding is bad. You know, it, there's some of it that's just not, been, not good. But I think the jury's still out on that, but I do believe that this is an area where the planning commission and the staff and uh, Indian Lake Village, you know, I, and I, I, I'm gonna compliment Director Free because he's very, very cognizant of all this stuff. And, and I think it's a good, good discussion for us to have going forward um, and might it be that this could be one of the reasons why we are hearing the word no uh, is it is it a situation where it's not as much about that but maybe we need to allow some variation um, within reason you know and I think this is good this is a good project it's in a piece of land that I don't think can be done anything else. I, I honestly think your 112 parking spots, I think that's gonna be a more marketing problem for you because those people that <laughs> buy are leasing those apartments, you know, uh, they're probably gonna wanna be closer to their apartment. So I think that's something you're gonna have to work out. Um, as I mentioned before, the density for me is, you know, and I, you know, you guys know I, I really look at this as far as the density is concerned. And I take every one on its merit. And I believe that this is consistent. It's consistent. It's got a little bit more variation, but it's consistent. It, it doesn't impact the traffic as bad as some of these others that we've had to deal with. And so, and I like the improvements and uh, uh, I'm, I'm gonna vote for it and I'm going to, uh, uh, I would, uh, 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 the waivers, I think that would be something I would look at too. Tim. Um, on, um, that was mentioned, uh, I think by Josh was the, in, in relation to the parking, the shared parking, which my, my staff report addresses shared parking. Josh had mentioned the possibility of reserved parking, which is completely different. Um, and because it's a plan development, the planning commission can vote on either one of those legitimately. But shared parking, obviously the, the spaces are shared. 
by either user reserved parking or taking those parking spaces away from the shopping center and they're dedicated solely to the apartment complex. So I, I, there yeah. needs to be clarification on that. Thank you. And um, I, I misspoke on that. I, I can, the, the letter that we shared with you, I believe today or on Friday, uh, references shared parking. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Hasty. <clears throat> I'll give a few opinions, sit there. Don't say a whole lot, and I'll be glad to make a motion if you're ready for one to yes, get sir. it on the table for yeah. discussions. Uh, I believe there is a need for some uh, high quality residential rentals or high quality rentals residentially here in Hendersonville. And I think it's pretty evident by the fact that we do have some developers that want to come in and build nothing but single family subdivisions, all rental. And uh, we also have investors coming in and they're buying homes up in our residential areas purely for the purpose of rentals. So I, I think uh, we need some quality rentals. I oppose the residential subdivisions for rental only and I prefer that we not see any more typical apartment complexes in Hendersonville. If you'd have asked me six months ago, Charles, would you vote for a 400 and, or 247 unit apartment complex? I'd have told you no right off. And probably would not on a typical apartment complex now, I wouldn't support it. But I think you've brought a unique product. Uh, it's not a typical apartment complex, but yet I think it would fit and accommodate that need maybe that Hendersonville has. Uh, Beth may be the brick lady. I may be the brick, brick guy in a lot of cases. But I think uh, architectural designs are changing. And, uh, and we probably need to accommodate some of that in some of our rules and regulations. But uh, maybe not too far too fast. But if there is a pot in Hendersonville to build that product, the property you're building it on is probably the best place in town to put it. It is out of the way. It's not visible. It's not your typical apartment complex. And if we're going to build somewhere like it anywhere in town, that's probably the best site to do it. And I have looked at the traffic study, and uh, I think they have more than adequately addressed or they have um, mitigated what their impact would be onto our transportation system. Uh, delays, queue times, levels of services, level of services, in some cases are even better than what they are now. So I think they've adequately addressed that. So I would move that we forward this request to BOMA with a recommendation for approval as submitted. With all staff comments and Correct. granting waivers? Correct. Okay. We have that motion. Do we have a second? Okay, we have two seconds. Y'all want to fight over? <laughs> we'll give it to we'll give it to Mr. Hardcastle. All right, we have a second. Any more discussion? Hearing none. Ms. Beery, call the roll. Altizer. Yes. Coker. No. Hardcastle. Yes. Hardwick. Yes. Hasty. Yes. Longmire. No. Peterson. 
Yes. Silkwood? No. Stringfellow? No. And Jenkins? Yes. All right, that passes um, seven to three. Okay, it passes 73. That will go forward with a recommendation from the Planning Commission. And I would note uh, they've also kind of given us a uh, the next steps. The general committee meeting for BOMA will be September 14th. Uh, estimated, they've got here, it's really cool. And then the regular meeting uh, for the first reading, September 28th. And I understand that this only requires one reading. Am I right? That's correct. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. All right. You're welcome. All right, uh, good work. Good questions, by the way. Uh, very, very good questions. Don't mind taking time for a clarity. The next thing we have is a site plan, uh, the Hallmark Hyundai parking lot expansion, and that's Timothy and Grant. So which one of you guys is going to go for it? Timothy, okay. They're pointing at each other. Yeah. <laughs> Timothy, go ahead. Thank you. Um, the... Uh, the last time the Planning Commission saw this, it was a couple of months ago in the form of a final development plan, uh, add use and amendment uh, to add motor vehicle dealership to the list of allowed uses that, that was denied by the Planning Commission, appealed to BOMA. BOMA approved that FDP amendment, and now what you have before you is the site plan. Um, the only uh, essential changes to this from what you saw before is they've to, uh, a little bit fewer parking spaces. They deleted a row of parking along the front to accommodate a retention pond and then added a second uh, access on Cumber Lane. Um, and they have agreed to all staff comments. Thank you, Mr. Witten. Um, my question for you, what are the, I know you got a parking lot here, uh, landscape plan for that. Do they have to, do they adhere, have to adhere to the landscape plan with the islands and everything or? Yes, they, they have, um, they have met the landscaping requirements of the ordinance and provided additional landscaping, uh, along the frontage of main street. Uh, in, in addition, they are providing, um, there's a, there's an existing kind of a four rail horse fence along that property. They'll be rehabbing that, keeping that, but also adding uh, stone columns to replicate the the stone columns and entry feature that's there at the corner of Cumber Lane and, uh, and Main Street. So a adding stone columns every 36 feet um, to kind of enhance the, the look of that, that frontage. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Mr. Peterson? Mr. Witten, does this design still include a sign for Mon Haven? Uh, no, the, um, they did not show a location for a sign. I don't know if they'll propose one later on, but as, as it's currently shown, it, it's not proposed. And I have another question. What type of lighting is going to be used on this lot? I know that there's apartments um, behind this, the site, as well as I'm, I'm, you know, concerned about the lighting that might impede the drivers on Gallatin Road. Sure. So the uh, they're they're using uh, area lights that are mounted on uh, poles that will be 22 feet or less in height. It will be, I believe, LED lights um, that are. Um, they, they won't they won't be able to cast light out beyond horizontal um, we, we can ask them uh, to look at adding glare shields on the lights that are closest to the perimeter of that uh, uh, the residential side there which I think would be a good idea I don't know if the applicants here to if you would just uh, introduce yourself and I'm Allison Turner. I'm with Greenlead Design. Um, I'm just here to answer any questions you may have as to the best of my ability. Um, we're happy to work with staff on the lighting. We had some questions about the lighting being in the middle of the parking versus being in the um, islands, uh, trying to not conflict with trees and things like that. But we're happy to work with staff on 
on keeping that downcast lighting so that it doesn't bleed off the site. Okay, Mr. Peterson, does that answer your question? Um, yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. And there's a lot of landscaping along the front of the road, so that, that should also assist with kind of keeping it more secluded. Okay. Any more, Mr. Har Mr. Harbrick? The, when this was here before, I was not going to support it, but it, it failed for lack of emotion because I didn't want to see a parking lot at the front door of the city. But BOMA has said, yeah. has approved it. So do we have the ability to say no? Good question. Keith. I think, I think you could say no, but on the, on the surface of it, once that had to do with adding the use, now we're at the site plan. So, for example, if there's a situation where there was a rezoning and you voted no on the rezoning, but then when the plat comes up, it wouldn't be necessarily appropriate to vote no on the plat if the plat meets all the requirements. And the same thing with this, with the site plan, is that even if you didn't support the initial adding the use, if they're meeting all the requirements, uh, then it would be appropriate uh, to to approve it uh, because it's meeting all those requirements. And, and in this case, they are. And that and they are. Okay. And yeah. and this is one thing you know that we've we've talked about, and maybe at a work session we'll talk about it again. It's uh, staff doesn't necessarily staff does not historically make any recommendations, uh, but that may be something we want to look at for things that we're really locked into. If there's no waivers and it's and it's pretty much. If you meet all the uh, zoning ordinance requirements, then really it should be approved. That may be something uh, that we want to consider the staff recommending approval and that kind of being that you're aware then that, that yeah, that this meets everything. They're not asking for a waiver and uh, it would be appropriate to approve it. But that's a very good question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hardwick. Uh, listen, uh, from here on out, you'll have to turn yourself off on the my, I've had a crisis here. My mouse died, so <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll go from there. But anyways, um, the, the fact of the matter is, is uh, BOMA has decided to, decided to use for us, so now it's just executing the site plan, and, and so, yeah. Uh, in response also to Mr. Hardwick, the, the landscape plan, correct me if I'm wrong, but the landscape plan does go above and beyond what is, is required and particularly heavy along that frontage of Main Street. There we go. Thank, you. That's working. Thank you very much. My mouse has had a resurrection. Here we go. And, and this, I might say that the, the staff on this particular thing, and it's something I think as we're looking at uh, future, any kind of other future similar type lots, car lots or display lots, that this is something where it's a parking lot, but we're really, this is one that's a little bit more park than lot. And I think that's that's something that's that's very important. And it, uh, you know, when we're looking at something like this in Hendersonville, you know, we want that extra uh, landscaping and that uh, you know it decreases the visibility of what you're trying to display. But that works well with our community uh, on the attractiveness. And in this case, the primary lot is on the corner, yeah. and so the access to this is obviously from the rear as well. So. As you'll see, the parking spaces that are not there are fronting Main Street. Okay, thank you very much. Any more questions? Mr. Coker? A uh, question was brought up, I believe, by Commissioner Peterson. I may not be remembering that correctly, but a Monhaven sign is not part of this. Why was that left out? Can you speak to that? I am not certain of the discussion. I know there was an extensive discussion between the owners of Mont, you know, Mont Haven and the owners of this property. So I don't know the details of that, but if if a sign was supposed to be placed in that, then we, we can obviously revise that. Okay. Does staff have any knowledge of why that was left out by chance? I, I'm not for sure what that agreement was with Mont Haven and the car, the car dealership. I think what might be appropriate is, is when this is approved or makes the motion, maybe also just say something uh, to provide clarification that any si any part of the agreement for the signage for Monthaven, that staff would ensure that that was taken care of 
in, in working with the uh, developer and the developer's representative. We can follow up with that, Was that the owner that, as well. Is that okay, Timothy? Yeah. And then that'll, that'll, that'll take care of it if that was the case. Because this is a planned development and we can do things that are a little different, maybe even outside of our sign ordinance a little bit, uh, you know, if we have that clear direction. And I think that might have been a part of it that was at BOMA, uh, but um, I don't know what that specific agreement was with Moth Haven well, and uh, the dealership. I'll go on and make a motion as Director Free described there on that, if there's no other discussion. Okay, so the motion's made to approve with all staff comments and to provide clarity on the Mont Haven sign and directing staff to handle it as needed. Second. Okay. Got a second on that? Who made the second? Mr. Peterson. Any more discussion? Ms. Beery, call the roll. Altizer? Yes. Coker? Yes. Hardcastle? Staining. Hardwick? Yes. Hasty? Yes. Longmire? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Silkwood? Yes. Stringfellow? Yes. And Jenkins? Yes. All right, that's nine and one abstention. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, the next uh, on the list is the Hendersonville Fire Station site plan and Sydney. Sure. Um, so this is a proposed fire station hall number seven at uh, the east end of Volunteer Park at Arrowhead. Um, the entirety of the park is 40, 45.7 acres and this will be at the very east end and a very small portion of the property. Um, the fire hall itself is proposed to be about 7,600 square feet with three bays and um, they will go before the Board of Zoning Appeals next week to ask for a variance to be able to um, have that third bay because the there's a stream buffer in the back and so they need that variance in order to not have to, to uh, otherwise they'd have to push the building back and only have two bays to meet the setback requirements. Um, it's a state residential zoning um, and I'm happy to answer any other questions you may have about it. Okay, are there any questions about it? If not, do we have a motion to approve with all staff comments? Move to approve by uh, Ms. Stringfellow, second by Ms. Silkwood. Any more questions? Call the roll. Altizer? Yes. Coker? Yes. Hardcastle? Yes. Hardwick? Yes. Hasty? Yes. Longmire? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Silkwood? Yes. Stringfellow? Yes. And Jenkins? Yes. That's all 10. Okay, next site plan is. Uh, is uh, twice daily on Saundersville. Timothy. Thank you. Uh, this site is located um, uh, in Indian Lake Village. It's uh, on the east end of that planned development uh, at Saundersville Road and the 386 off ramp across the street from Skin Solutions. You can see Skin Solutions there at the bottom of the, the aerial map. Um, the uh, Indian Lake Village plan development allows two, allowed two fuel centers overall, one of those on Indian Lake, and that's now was taken by twice daily at Saundersville and Indian Lake, um, and then it allowed one other one on Saundersville east of Stop 30, so this would take that other entitlement. Um, so if this is approved, there would be no more fuel centers permitted uh, in that plan development. Um, so they have agreed to all staff comments. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Whitten. Any questions? Ms. Silkwood? Just a quick question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I'm reading this correctly, Mr. Whitten, there's also a white bison coffee drive through so it's also a, a, a drive through eatery, coffee place, and a gas and station. Is that right? Too. Sandwiches also? So white bison is... Uh, it's just a brand of Twice Daily. It's not a. It's not a separate, like a quick service restaurant or, or anything like that. Um, so they they do have a a, a drive through, um, but it would be accessory to the um, the Twice Daily Fuel Center. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Wooden. Any more questions? Do we have a motion to approve with all staff comments? I got a question, Mr. Hasty. 
You can stand in front of this one and you can see a Speedway and a Thornton's. Do we really need another service station out there? You want me to answer that? <laughs> Okay, we need a motion to approve with all staff comments. I'll make the motion to approve. Okay, thank you. Any second? Ms. Longmire seconds. Any more questions? Ms. Beery, call the roll. Altizer? Yes. Coker? Yes. Hardcastle? Yes. Hardwick? Yes. Hasty? Yes. Longmire? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Silkwood? Yes. Stringfellow yes. and Jenkins. Yes. That's all 10. Okay. Uh, staff level projects approved. I won't take time to read all of those. You can see those for yourself. Staff level projects pending. You see all the Durham, Hazel Path, Jolly Ollie, Savannah, and Todd's car team. Um, you can read that. We have one resolution commending the acceptance of the completed streets in Durham Farms phases one, sections two, three, four, five, six, and seven, and 15. Do we have a motion to uh, accept that resolution? Motion to accept. Motion to accept. Okay. Uh, so I have a second. Second by Ms. Stringfellow. Any questions? Ms. Beery, call the roll. Altizer? Yes. Coker? Yes. Hardcastle? Yes. Hardwick? Yes. Hasty? Yes. Longmire? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Silkwood? Yes. Jenkins? Yes. That's all 10. Okay, Director Free, Planning Director Comments. Yes, I'll go, go ahead. <laughs> there you go. Here we go. Uh, yeah, I've just got just a uh, just a few things that I'll go through here fairly fairly quickly. Uh, uh, myself and the staff met today with uh, our consultant Kimley Horn, uh, that's been awarded the uh, contract uh, to work with us on the uh, West Main Old Town redevelopment plan. So uh, you'll be hearing more about that in the coming days and. And so we're excited to get that kicked off and and we'll be involved in the public and the Planning Commission uh, and uh, we'll have a lot of different opportunities for input on that. So we're very, uh, very excited about that. Uh, also, uh, here within the last week or so, uh, we submitted uh, grants uh, for COVID funding uh, for various improvements, uh, some for ADA improvements uh, within the community. Others is kind of interesting, uh, LED, LED light replacement for streetlights on West Main and uh, then uh, then starting to go up uh, Indian Lake Boulevard. So that's uh, that's going to be good. Uh, and then also wayfinding signage uh, to do wayfinding signage specifically along the West Main area and the Indian Lake uh, Boulevard to uh, to start to start with. Uh, these were grants uh, that were submitted. Uh, we made it through the first round and then now we're in the second round for those and appreciate all the hard work that uh, Grant Green did uh, to get all of that information together and get that get that submitted. Uh, just an update on the New Shackle Island rezoning that we had, I think at our last meeting for the subway. Uh, that's been to the general committee and it's forwarded uh, to the full BOMA and it'll be on BOMA's agenda uh, next week. And that was just a few of the things that I uh, wanted, to, wanted to mention. And thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Director Free. Uh, no other business before us. Ms. Stringfield, do you have a motion? Uh, make a motion, we adjourn. We have second. a second. Second by Mr. Peterson. All in favor say aye. 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 We're adjourned. <laughs> that was